All right, well, the topic I'm going to be preaching on the next seven to eight weeks, maybe nine weeks, is the topic of reaching people in our community. And uh, I just simply titled it Reach. And uh, the subtitle is Reaching People for Jesus Christ One Person at a Time. Now, I like, uh, I look forward to this, to this series. It's, uh, it's something that's really on my heart, just reaching people, talking to people about the gospel. Uh, we need to reach people around us. And uh, when I say that there is a lost and dying world, I, I don't mean that hypothetically. I mean that with all sincerity. There is a lost and dying world. And there are, uh, there's only a couple things I can, I can really promise you, and one thing that I can promise you is that one day you will stand before the Lord, and you will have to give an account. The Bible says that for, you give an account for every idle word that man speaks. So not only the things that you said, but the things that you didn't say, those are idle words. And one day we're going to stand before the Lord, and we're going to have to give an account for that. And there is a lost and dying world out there that needs Jesus Christ. And I love messages like this. They're evangelistic. They're, they're goal-oriented. They're, they're trying, to, trying to get us all together on the same page, that we can then go forth into the world and do what Christians are called to do. And many of us don't even know what that is. They don't even know what that looks like. I don't know how many of you have had a job before where you get there on the first day and you don't have a clue what you're supposed to do. A lot of Christians are like that for their entire Christian life. They're like that. They just they become a Christian and they they're, 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 they stay a Christian. Obviously, we're saved and 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 we're we're always saved by God and and uh, we will never lose that salvation. But it's like they've arrived on the job site, so to speak, and they don't they don't know what they're supposed to do. They don't have any idea. So the te- the, the 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 goal of this message is to is to really equip the saints for the work of the ministry. It's to gear us toward that. It's to get us focused on the things that are important and teach us how to, how to do those things. I, I've done something here that I've, that I've never really done before in a message, and, and it's, a little, it's, it's a little scary because uh, there's not a whole lot of margin here for, for uh, deviating into maybe some things that I find are, are important, but I'm just going to go with it. I've given you the outline for the next seven to eight weeks. This is a basic outline. And I really want us to know where we're going. I want us to have a, have a path, a plan, so that as we talk about reaching people, we know what the goals are. So I'm just going to go over those uh, real simply with you. First of all, part one, part one is dealing with the man. That's, that's personally, that is uh, the, the preparation of us. This is part one, dealing with, with the man. Now, I would say the man or the woman. It's the person who is supposed to be out there and uh, promulgating the gospel. The one who's supposed to be reaching people for Christ. This is dealing with us personally. And uh, we need to deal with us personally. There are several things that we're going to talk about. Next week, we're going to be talking about having a, a clear head. We need to have a clear head when we go out to reach people with the gospel, we have to understand our objectives. We have to have a clear head. Most of what we'll be talking about is having an eternal perspective. And friends, can I tell you this morning that if we don't have an eternal perspective, if we don't think on a bigger picture than the here and the now, we're going to get nowhere. And what, what, what purpose would it be to take uh, an eternal message to someone who only has a, a, a kind of a temporal viewpoint. So we have to change our perspective. We have to change our perspective from being a temporal perspective to an eternal one. This is where uh, efficiency happens when it comes to reaching people with the gospel. So uh, the first part, dealing with the man, we're going to talk about having a clear head. Secondly, we're going to be talking about having a caring heart. Can I add, too, that if you don't have a caring heart for people, we're going to miss this. We've heard it been said before that if, if people don't know how, how much you, you know, people really don't care how much you know until they know how much you care, right? Why would somebody care about how much you know if they don't even know that you care about them? We have to have a caring heart. You know, when it comes to reaching people, lost people, if you don't have a heart for lost people, you'll never find them. And we'll go around this world, 
and we'll, we'll constantly be in a state of, well, I don't care about them, and I don't care about them, and there's no need to save them. It comes from a caring heart. So the second message we'll talk about is having a caring heart. And thirdly, thirdly, we're going to be talking about having clean hands. This is dealing with the purity. Having clean hands. I taught a, a series uh, years ago, and it was uh, on the temple, the tabernacle as, as a whole, and and they have all of these different, uh, different things sitting out front. They have uh, one which is, uh, uh, you know, the kind of, uh, where, they, where they burned the, uh, the sacrifice. And then they had what was, what was called uh, uh, a laver, if you will. And, and it's where you could go in and you could wash your hands. And, and uh, this is really, really important before they went into the temple to have this purification process. You need to have a... Uh, have a purification before you go into the temple, right? So when I think about us as personally, as, as uh, individuals going out to reach people, we have to have pure hands. And you're only truly going to be effective as a witness for Christ if you have a life that is honoring to God. And, and so many times you have people who go out into the world and they try to be a testimony to God, but they don't have pure hands. They're not, they don't have a clean lifestyle. Try to be effective when you're filthy. And so these things right here, the preparations are really important. Having a clear head, a caring heart, and clean hands. So that's kind of part one of the outline. Those, those will be the next three weeks. Part two is dealing with the mission. Dealing with the mission. And the mission is the Great Commission. It's what we were instructed with as Christians, what we should be taking and doing, right? The Great Commission is comprised of two components. Number one, preaching the gospel. This is really important. This is really important. If we don't know what the gospel is, then how can we preach it effectively? And there are a lot of people who go out there and claim that they're preaching the gospel, and maybe what they're doing is they're preaching a gospel of another kind, but they're not preaching the saving grace of Jesus Christ. So we need to talk about that. What is that? Some people, have, uh, some people have said, well, the gospel is simple, and it is, and they've reduced everything to simplicity. But you can be uh, simply inaccurate as well. So we want to make sure we're accurate in our simplicity. We don't want to say things like, a person must turn from all their sin in order to be saved. Because that's not the gospel. The good news is not that you save yourself, but that Jesus came and saved you. That's the good news. It's not good news if I have to save myself. I can't save myself. So if I have to clean up my life in order to be saved, I'll, ne I'll never be saved. Because I don't have the power to do that. Only Christ has the power to do that. So we're going to talk about the gospel as it, um, as it pertains to the Great Commission. Uh, secondly, in part two, we're going to talk about making disciples. Making disciples. I've heard, uh, I've heard ministers say this before. They've said, I would rather lead them and leave them than never to have led them at all. Now, I agree partially with that. But the goal is not just to go out there and lead a bunch of people to Christ and then leave them. The whole goal is to disciple them. It's like a pastor maybe who comes to the, comes to the altar and he's with uh, uh, the, the, the bride and the, and the groom-to-be and he gets them married and they put the ring on the finger and then he says, so long. And oftentimes, that's what the Christian life is like. A person gets saved, and then they don't know what to do. They don't know how to train kids, parents, right? I mean, we can, we, pretty much a lot of people can be a parent, but not very many people are parenting. And so my goal as a pastor, as part of the Great Commission, is not only to reach them with the gospel, but then to teach them. Don't just leave them. Listen, the, the, the new birth, John chapter 3, that new birth is, is miraculous. It's spectacular. But that's only the beginning. Now how are they going to live out their Christian life? They have a whole Christian life to live. Let's teach them how to do that. That's discipleship. Most pastors will maybe get the gospel right, and then they'll completely leave off the discipleship part. They'll say, well, let's lead them, and then let's just, you know, hopefully they'll make it out there. It's a crazy concept, and let's not do that. So part two is dealing with the mission. So you've got the man, part one, the mission, part two. Part three is dealing with the method. 
dealing with the method. The method is the way the man carries out the mission. That's what the method is. And we're going to talk about two things primarily in the upcoming weeks. Number one, uh, we're going to talk about some principles when it comes to the method of preaching the gospel, about reaching others. There's a, there, is a, there are some, some really hardcore principles when we talk about reaching people with the gospel, with Jesus Christ. And uh, I'm going to give you some of those principles in the upcoming weeks. I'll give you an example of one right now. A principle in reaching, a principle just in general might be giving your best to God. That is a principle that should be practiced, giving your best to God. I think whether you're here today wearing a suit and tie or not makes not a whole lot of difference to me, but here's what I mean. The principle is give your best to God in your dress. The, there's a principle in giving your best to God that is talking about you with your spouse. Giving your best to God when you get to work, getting to work on time, all of these things. There is, an, a, is a universal principle that we talk about giving your best to God all the time. does not change. It does not change. It cannot change because it's a principle. The following week after that, we're going to be talking about preferences. About preferences. These are things that can change, that aren't tied into a principle. Let me give you an example of, of a preference. Let's say service times. Service times, when it comes to church, might be a preference. Service times, the length of service, I, I, I enjoy three hours of, of uh, service on Sunday. Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night. And that is a, a preference. However, there is some tie-in to a principle. And that is, have more church, right? Not forsaking the assembly of yourselves together. But, but, but getting together uh, much, even much more as you see the day approaching. That's the goal. As you see that there's a need, we, we, uh, we have more church. The name of the church, it's a great example of a, of a preference. And another, one of the things I'm going to be addressing shortly is the name of Northside Baptist Church. How important is Northside Baptist Church? One of the things I'd like to do is I'd like to change it to Quad City Baptist Church and be inclusive to the whole Quad Cities, not just the people on the north side. That's a preference. And when it comes to reaching people, there are some preferences. One of the first series I taught here on a Sunday school when I came here almost six years ago now, six years ago, yeah, it was modernized without compromise. We can, we can modernize without compromising. We can do some things with our preferences that don't invade the principles. And that'll be week seven. When it comes to reaching people with the gospel, what does that look like? Now, I've given you the outline, so I have to kind of be true to that. Now, I will say this, that as the Spirit leads, so I don't want to tie myself down to this completely, but I am going to try to stick with this. I've taken a lot of time to pray about this, to, to outline this, and that's the basics. Now, let's get into the message today, and I just want to give you a couple of things. I want to give you an introduction, kind of a just a thought, but then I want to. I have a note on strategy and then a note on succession. So let's talk quickly about the introduction. And there's a, there's a passage of Scripture that means a lot to me. And I think that the more that we really contemplate this passage of Scripture, the more effective we'll be for the Lord. And now some commentators have chalked up Luke 16, 19 to 31 as a... Um, a parable. They have said that, uh, they say that this is a, a parable. It's, a, it's an example of something that happened. Can I just tell you that I disagree with that? I think that this record is a record of something that actually happened. In parables, the Lord never used names. There's a name used here. I believe this is an, more than just an example. This really happened. And I want to read this to you this morning. I want you to feel this passage, Luke 16, 19 to 31. There was a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, 
which was laid at the head his gate, full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died, and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, this is referring to the rich man, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he, the rich man, cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, Remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, the rich man, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay. Father Abraham, but if one would, if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. I think if we could all just get this picture. The rich man only wanted a drop of water. And then he was so concerned that he asked him, if you could just send someone to my, to my father's house, because I have five brothers, that I don't want them to be here with me. I've done a lot of funerals for people I don't know. And I don't know if the person is saved or not that died. I don't know if they're spending an eternity with our Lord, rejoicing in heaven, receiving their riches, or if they're spending an eternity in hell, away from God. But one thing I always say at a funeral, and I can say this universally, is this, that without a shadow of a doubt, this person wants you to know this message. And then I give them the gospel. Because whether they're rejoicing in heaven or whether they're in hell, they want their relatives to know about Jesus Christ. This is not just some fictitious story. This is not something that's make-believe or made up. This is real, friends. This is the real deal. There is a heaven and there is a hell. And if we could get everybody in this room on a bus and just drive them through hell, we'd create the world's best evangelists. We would be out there evangelizing the lost like you'd never see. Let us never forget this. And this will be the tone by which I teach these next seven weeks. Now let's give a note about strategy. A note about strategy, and, and, and I want to have a strategy for reaching people. I want to have a strategy for reaching the lost, for Christ. And so, in saying that, not all evangelism is aggressive. Not all evangelism is, is aggressive. And, and there are the people who get kind of the bad name, who are standing on a street corner with a sign, and, and they're shouting, you know, trust Christ as your Savior. And it, it's not always aggressive. I mean, we can hand out heaven tracts and not, uh, not be uh, offensive. The gospel in and of itself is offensive, but we don't have to be offensive. 
And so not all evangelism is aggressive, but not all evangelism is effective either. And, and evangelism as a whole can take a lot of time. It takes time to reach people with the gospel. Now, we can be aggressive and offend them, or we can give it a little time, build some relationships with people, and evangelize. Now, I'm not going to say that the person who's aggressive is wrong. I just can't do that. I cannot say that the person who is standing on the corner doing that is wrong. D.L. Moody has a story. He used to tell the story of a lady who came to him criticizing his method of attempting to win people to the Lord. Moody had only received a fifth grade education, had poor English skills, and was aggressive in seeking people out and pointedly asking them if they were saved. I have no problem with that. That's not the method that I use. I have no problem with that. God blessed his preaching at witnessing ministries greatly, but some people took offense at his style, and Moody's reply to this critic was gracious. And this is what he said. He said, I agree with you. I don't like the way that I do it either. Tell me, how do you do it? To which she replied, I don't do it. And he said, then I like my way of doing it better than your way of not doing it. I would rather somebody pull a heaven track out of their pocket and say, brother, I don't know if you're saved or not, but I'd like you to read this heaven track because you need to know where you're going when you die. Then someone who stands all the way back here and says, maybe somebody will give them the gospel someday. I would much rather take an aggressive approach than no approach at all. So we have to have a strategy, and, and some of what we'll be talking about in the upcoming weeks will be how to best balance aggressiveness and effectiveness. I don't think necessarily all aggressiveness is effective, but neither is not saying anything at all. That's not effective either. So we'll talk about that in the upcoming weeks. We're also going to talk, uh, get, uh, talk about succession. So here's a little note on succession. And we've heard people say that there is no success without a successor. There is no success without a successor. Who's coming after you to preach the gospel to a lost and dying world, right? So we must always be replacing ourselves. And 2 Timothy is a, is a wonderful place for this, where Paul instructs Timothy on this matter. And he says in chapter 2, verse 2, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. It's a great example. Now, notice here that this verse extends beyond Timothy's generation. This wasn't just for Timothy and his generation. This went beyond that. It has, a, has kind of a, a neat uh, compound effect, too, if everybody were to do this. And uh, one commentator said this. Instead, Paul was looking, to, uh, looking two generations beyond his young disciple. And he breaks it down this way. And the things, that's the second generation, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, that's the first generation, the same commit thou to faithful men, that's the third generation, who shall be able to teach others also, that's the fourth generation. So the second generation ought to learn from the first so that they can teach the third who can teach the fourth. You see that? It just kind of perpetuates. I love that. Now, so many of us, we stop and we don't, we don't get into this. We, don't, we, we, we actually reject what the first generation said. And any of you kids who have grown up in a home, most of you at some point in time probably have rebelled against your parents. Because the first generation didn't really know what they were talking about, but we know what we're talking about. But then we have kind of this, this skewed idea of what reaching people is all about, so how can we teach the third to teach the fourth? And you see, the same thing we need to commit to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So we need to look forward and ask ourselves as we talk about succession, how do we teach that generation who then can teach the next generation? I think we'll have tremendous success. 
Some of the most depressing statistics I've read are statistics based on how many people are saved and how long it would take to, or how long it would take to reach the unsaved. How many Christians are there and how long will it take to reach the non-Christian? Now, some of these some of these statistics are just just downright depressing. And I tell you, it, it totally thwarts my plan. You know, your plan of reaching the world just seems so big and it's it's so huge. Like, how do you reach everybody? There's 7.3 billion people in the world. You can't possibly reach them all with a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, right? Found this online. This was pretty neat. According to Pew Research, Christianity remains the world's largest religious group at 31.2%. Now, I will say this. When the Pew Research Group did their research, um, they kind of lumped some categories together. Uh, I think they, they kind of lumped a lot of different religions in terms of Christianity together. There are a lot of people who, who say they're a Christian who don't even go to church. There are a lot of people who say they're a Christian. I mean, you live in America, you're a Christian, right? That's what they say anyway. But these are not actual people who have trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And so they say 30, uh, 31.2%. Now, ironically, ironically, what's happened in, in America is a husband and a wife have two kids, and the husband and wife die. You're no better off. You still have only two people. Now, if you tend to have less passion, your kids are going to even have less passion. They're not going to want to serve the Lord. They're not going to want to love the Lord. So they're going to lose some enthusiasm that you thought you had, right? So they're going to water down even further. So here you go. Now you have two really desiring Christians who just love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, strength. You have two children, the husband and wife die, and, and they're less passionate. What's interesting is the second statistic here. Next to Christianity, next is Islam at 24.1%. Whoa, 24.1%. That's huge. Now, ironically... They have a lot of children, and they tend to get more passionate, don't they? They tend to get more radical. And so while they're producing a lot of children who are just really excited about Islam, we have children who tend to be lukewarm, and then they have children who are lukewarm and lukewarm and more lukewarm, and before long, they're just ice cold. So you don't think these numbers are going to flip? They will. They absolutely will, 31.2%, 24.1%. I guarantee in a matter of 10 years, they'll be different. And Islam is raging. I mean, they will be so far beyond us because they're having 10, 12 kids. They're having a lot of kids. The unaffiliated was 16%. Hinduism, 15.1%. Buddhism, 6.9%. Folk religions, 5.7%. Others, 0.8%. Judaism, 0.2%. These are staggering numbers especially considering the fact that Christians aren't reproducing Christians that are more passionate than their parents. We're producing Christians who are more lukewarm, which will eventually become ice cold. It's going to take a concerted effort to reach people for Jesus Christ. That's what it's going to take. It's going to take a concerted effort. If you were an outstanding, gifted evangelist, with an international reputation, and if under God, you could win a 1,000 people a day. 1,000 people every single day for Christ. It would take you personally 10,000 years to win everybody. And that's without any sort of uh, population explosion. 10,000 years for one person to reach everybody. I don't know about you, but I'm not living to be 10,000 years old. We don't have that much time. Recently, we, uh, I, had a, uh, I had a big Nerf gun that uh, I bought online. This was a couple years ago. I bought it on a whim. It was really cool. It had shot the big darts. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Big, they're about that thick. They look like shooting hot dogs. They were amazing. And they would really get you, too. We've had more Nerf gun fights in this room than I care to admit. Matter of fact, there are times I'll be preaching, and I'll look, I'll, I'll look over here, and I'll be thinking, oh, there's a Nerf dart right in there. You know? And uh, so we, would, we had a lot of fun with this Nerf gun. And finally, it just got so big, and I said, well, we got to dump this thing. We got to get rid of it. So, uh, so as opposed to 
as just giving it away, we sold it. We sold it for $5. I bought that thing for $75. I sold it for five. My kids sold it. And I said, you know, do whatever you want to do with it. You know, put it out. I said, I bet some kid from the learning center will come in here and they'll pay five bucks for it. Sure enough, they came in. They sold it for $5. And I said, it's amazing how much money that was. And they said, what, the $5 or $75? I said, no, the compounded interest on $75. They said, what do you mean? I said, well, let's break out the compound interest calculator online. And we're going to talk a little bit about investments real quick, son. So we broke it out and I put in $75 and I... I, uh, I amortized it over 30 years or something like that, and I said, we're going to add 10 or 12% of, of, uh, of returns on this, and it ended up to be like a $30,000 gun. And I said, see, 75 bucks. We blew $75, and it cost me $30,000. We put that in a good mutual fund, growth stock. I said, can you imagine that? I said, it's amazing what a compound effect can do. Isn't that neat? You guys know what I'm talking about, right? You all have kind of a blank stare. You know what I'm talking about. Compound interest. Check it out. Put a little bit of money in every month and stay diligent with it, and you'll be rich, right? I mean, technically. Now, when we talk about one person reaching 1,000 people for the next 10,000 years, it sounds big. I read this, and I thought this was interesting. If you are a true disciple of Christ, and if you are able, under God, to win just one person to Christ every year, one person, and if you were able to disciple them within that year and teach them how to win one person the following year, and if you stayed faithful to that, where you won one person, and then taught them how to win one person, then next year they won one person, and you won one person, and then the next year you've got several people winning people, discipling people, how long would it take you to win the world? 32 years. If every Christian was doing what a Christian ought to do, The compound effect, we could win the entire world, 7.3 billion in 32 years. Staggering. You know, we we, we read things like the Great Commission, and we say, that is just so big, there's no way to win everybody. But if every one person won one person and discipled them how to win one person, we could essentially see the entire world evangelized in my lifetime. Is that crazy or what? These aren't, these aren't fake numbers. In 10 years, it's like, wow, there's no way we can reach. But compound effect works in the later years. So in the last year, you're reaching billions of people because every one person is reaching one person, teaching them how to reach one person. 32 years. I thought that was amazing. It really changes the possibilities, doesn't it? Because it seems so big. It seems so, so huge. How are we going to reach people for Christ? Well, we don't just reach them. We don't just lead them and leave them, do we? We don't just lead them and then leave them alone and then never lead someone else to Christ or teach them how to lead someone. We lead them and then we train them. It's amazing that that's part of the Great Commission. And that you, you read... You read Matthew 28, Mark 16, preach the gospel, make disciples. It's amazing that it can be done. It can be done. I want to leave you with just kind of a couple concluding thoughts. First of all, first of all, we need to have prayer. We need to have prayer. Matthew 21, 22 says, And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. Did you know that it's God's will that all men be saved? The Bible says that he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know, that's God's will. I I believe that if we were a praying church, and if if the church as a whole began to pray the way they ought to pray, and ask God for clear direction, ask God for a soul, put someone in my life that I can win them. This year, win them early so you have plenty of time to disciple them. And help them to be able to win someone else. And look at them in the eye and say, don't stop doing that. Don't stop doing that. If we were to pray and ask God for his blessing, I think it would happen.
know what happened. Number two, have conversation about it. Have conversation about the things of God in front of people. Romans 10, 17, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith, you don't, you, if you never speak of the things of God, people aren't going to get saved. People are not going to know Christ as their Savior. Now listen, every conversation that I have with somebody, I do not talk about the Lord. But just about every conversation I have with somebody, I try to, I try to gear it towards things of the Lord. I let it come up in my, in my normal behavior, my normal speech. And, and I do give out tracts. I do give out quite a few of them. And I hand them out, and I pull them out of my pocket, and I say, hey, I want to give this to you. I pastor church. A little information about our church on the backside is the most important thing. Tell a man how they can go to heaven when they die. There's probably been many people of you who have been around me as I've given out a track before. I've said that very same thing so many times I can't even count. But I try to spin things toward the Lord. And if it comes up, great. If not, I try to synthetically do it, right? Not aggressively, but we need to have conversation. So we need to have prayer. We need to have conversation. And then thirdly, we need to have conviction. Have conviction. Hebrews 9, 27. And it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. We are all going to stand before the Lord. We need to have some conviction. This is real. This is real. I read a quote yesterday. I thought it was very, very uh, timely because it's the end of this, the message. And it said this very simply. You are a Christian because somebody cared. Now it's your turn. You are a Christian today because somebody cared about you. Now it's your turn to care about somebody else. Don't think in terms of 10,000. Think of in terms of 32. 30 two years if everybody did their job. And this isn't a big job. It's one person. January 1st of 2020, you can lead one person to the Lord and spend the next 364 days discipling them. Did you know that? It seems so easy. If everybody, if we started with just this room where everybody could lead one person to the Lord and to disciple them, the, the, the compound effect, we would win them way faster than 32 years. Because we're starting with such a big group of people. 32 years, you win the entire world. But we have to start with the gospel. Telling people how they can go to heaven when they die. I want this hand right here to represent you and me. And I want this wallet to represent all of our sin. The Bible says that here we are with all of our sin. A lot of churches, this is what they'll say. They'll say, turn over a new leaf. Problem is, is you still have your sin. Some churches say give money to the church. Some churches say uh, walk an aisle or pray a certain prayer or do something that you can save yourself. That's what it is. It's a works gospel. You're, you here are trying to save yourself by doing something. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, not church membership. It's not walking an aisle or praying a prayer. The wages of sin is death. Someone has to die for your sin. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came to this earth to die for your sin. Now, if you died right here, if here you are, you died, you're going to spend an eternity separated from God. Here's God, and here you are, an eternity separated from here. You're like Luke 16, because you tried to work your way. It was the rich man who was trying to work his way to heaven that spent an eternity separated from God. And here Jesus Christ is, who came to this earth to die on the cross for your sin. The wages of sin is death. And the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. Not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works. Because there'll be no boasters in heaven, right? There'll be nobody in heaven that says, look, look at what I did. Look at what I did. I turned from all my sin. And, and, and I gave all this money to the church. And I prayed all these prayers. And, and I did all of these things, these wonderful things. And, and Lord, look at me. There'll be no boasters. The Bible says it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, 
but according to his mercy, he saves us, right? We sang the song, his goodness and mercy. It was his mercy he saved us. And it's when we, in the quietness of our own mind, believe that Jesus Christ died for our sin, that he made the debt payment for me, the death payment for me, he paid for my sin. Not because I'm some good guy, because I'm not. It's because he's perfect, and he who knew no sin was made sin for us. He didn't have any sin to pay for by himself, because he's God. If you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, this is where it all starts. By trusting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And then it's our responsibility to go back into the world and tell other people about Christ. And then disciple them and tell them not just about his the salvation that we experience through faith, but also the wonderful life of sanctification we have through him. He didn't just save us from the penalty of sin. He saved us from the power of sin. I'm thankful for that. And we have a responsibility now to preach the gospel and make disciples, and we can reach the entire world in 32 years. Sound crazy? Sounds crazy to me. I love it, though, because it's true. When you go home tonight, I want you to do the math. I want you to do the compound effect. Rate of return, add one person for yourself the next 32 years, and then add someone else for the rate of return for 29 years, or 31 years, and then 30 years and 29, and just, just watch it just explode. The numbers are just crazy. We can do it. And maybe we won't win the world, but we may win Davenport. We may win the Quad Cities. We can certainly win our neighbor. We can certainly win our neighbor. 